Do you sometimes wonder how you could truly have an impact when it comes to diversity, equity, inclusion and belonging? How do you know you are moving in the right direction when it comes to becoming a more inclusive individual? As diverse as two peas in a pod brings topics such as ethnicity, gender, sexuality or religion on the table. We talk about research and science, but also emotions, feelings and vulnerability. We discuss allyship, advocacy and privilege. But most importantly, we talk action. Because without action, we stay still. And when it comes to diversity, equity, inclusion and belonging, stillness is never the answer. Welcome to As Diverse as Two Peas in a Pod. In today's episode, I have the great pleasure to discuss with Felipe Cardenas. Felipe is a business executive with more than 15 years experience leading high performance teams in Europe and Latin America. He is an advisor to different boards and senior leadership about diversity, equality and inclusion and has strong experience in drafting and implementing business development models in strategic planning and in scaling performance sustainably for SMEs in the Americas. He is currently the CEO and President of the Colombian LGBT Chamber of Commerce, a non-for-profit organization that promotes economic empowerment in Colombia for sexually diverse individuals through entrepreneurship support, employment opportunities in safe working environments and supplier diversity connections. Felipe and I together explore the benefits and advantages of inclusive procurement or how organizations can make the most out of utilizing diverse suppliers for their business. Felipe, welcome. Thank you very much for joining me today. I'm looking forward to our discussion. Thank you very much, Julian. Thank you for inviting me to this opportunity. So I know, I know we're going to talk about a, a topic that is maybe a, a little bit more specific and a little bit different to maybe some of the things we talk about often in, in the world of diversity and inclusion. But before we dive in, um, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about your story, actually, to share with our listeners. Okay, so I'm trying to be brief in one minute about myself. I can share that, as you just say, my name is Felipe Cárdenas. I am Colombian. I am coming from this beautiful country in South America that I'm really proud of. Um, belong also to the Latin culture of the entire Latin America landscape. We share a lot of common values with uh, our neighbor countries in terms of the way we socialize with people, the way we express our emotions, uh, our strong appetite for music, for dancing, for gastronomy, for nature. That is, is, is something that we have as a great asset. In Latin America, we, we, we have strong nature and a lot of things to, to see from the nature. Uh, I have a background on business management. I had a, a major in business management and a minor on trade, on international trade. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I was a very active ISEC member for a lot of years in ISEC in Colombia, then in the Dominican Republic, later in ISEC International, and then later I did my internship in, uh, through ISEC uh, as well. Uh, right now, I'm a very strong ISEC alumni, so I'm contributing mm -hmm. different causes and support different initiatives of the people that were members of ISEC and today we call ourselves alumni. Um, I became an entrepreneur after some experiences in the corporate sector. I, I have already started and owned businesses since 2009, so it's been over 10 years of driving into businesses, and I'm still learning how to do it in the right way. And then the last things that I have done is become really active of, on something that I call economic activism. And it's mm -hmm. the way I'm promoting social causes and especially working on sexual diversity uh, under the umbrella of diversity, equality, and inclusion for uh, the economic perspective. I run the Colombian LGBT Chamber of Commerce based in Bogota. I have been the president of that non-for-profit organization since 2012. And I'm already looking forward to what I'm going to do with the rest years that are coming ahead after this almost 10 years leading that organization in Colombia and generating a lot of activities and impact for sexually diverse individuals in Colombia and in Latin America. 
Amazing. Well, thank you very much for sharing all this information. And um, I, I, I love hearing the diversity already about the different things that you've done in the past and your experiences and where you're heading as well now. Um, and I think when, when, we, when we had a chat first um, a few weeks ago, um, obviously we talked about you kind of being part of different communities. You talked about now the Latin American community, but also the LGBT community. Um, you mentioned about living in different countries. But one topic that um, was very interesting that came on the table that you mentioned, it was um, at, at the heart of a lot of the things you do is inclusive procurement. And for me, it was, it, was a, it was a new thing and I was looking forward to hear more about it. So maybe we can start with that actually. What, what is inclusive procurement? Yes, and, and thank you, Julian, for that question because for me, these almost 10 years of experience working in diversity issues, that's probably the jewel of the crown. I will call it in that way. Inclusive procurement is probably the best way individuals on the economic spectrum of, of the life or, or, or on businesses might have to actually walk the talk when we are talking about uh, diversity, equality, mm -hmm. and inclusion. Inclusive procurement is actually a very more recent concept in different countries. In the US, it began in the 1960s, and there are a lot of strong cases on different um, corporations that were really ahead within their years of evolution, thinking in how to be more inclusive with the different stakeholders they have or they represent. Mm -hmm. Back in the uh, 60s, IBM, the IT corporation that everyone knows globally, started working on putting together different initiatives to diversify on the sources of their vendors. Mm -hmm. The different suppliers they were having that were supplying every single item you can imagine from the toilet paper they use on the corporate offices to the lights and the lighting they were using to enlighten the different servers and the technology of the labs they were producing this technology of hardware at the beginning and later software uh, and passing through all the supply chain for such a big corporations. They were really looking forward how they can diversify the sources of from where they were buying products. Mm -hmm. And then, more than inclusive procurement as a title, they started working in something that was called supplier diversity, that a lot of corporations start not, not to imitate, but to follow that path and start diversifying the sources on where they were getting the goods, products, and services they needed to produce or, do, or to transform the, on the products and services they were having. In that sense, one of the first things that happened in the early 70s where that where they were including under their procurement policies that they will be more proactive getting products and services from suppliers that were women-owned businesses. Mm -hmm. And that was probably one of the first steps that we saw on the inclusive procurement concept on how corporations were getting more um, proactive in reaching women-owned businesses to try to get their products and services. And that later started evolving in a lot of different, uh, let's say, segments or categories or different type of minority business. Mm -hmm. And in a countries like Canada, the US, now in some of countries in Latin America and some of them in Europe too, are getting very deeply kind of micro-targeting where are those different niche of individuals that are a minority per different territories because in some countries it's more relevant X, Y, and Z group than in other ones. Uh, for example, we in Latin America, we are prioritizing a lot the different initiatives and products and services that are coming from indigenous people because we have a lot of indigenous or native Americans as we can call them. Um, and now a lot of them are merging into entrepreneurial initiatives. So a lot of corporations want to get goods and services from them. Um, and under that major umbrella, it was around the 70s and the 80s too where the inclusive procurement concept started talking about supplier diversity from LGBT-owned businesses. Back in the old days, we were not talking about LGBT as an acronym. We were talking mm -hmm. about, about gay businesses because mm -hmm. that was the most visible thing. Um, and then, since then, a lot of corporations are implementing 
a lot of inclusive procurement programs and policies that are driving strong businesses for these businesses that are actually small, but are able to scale up and to succeed thanks to those inclusive procurement policies a lot of corporations has. Just to close up and to sum up, inclusive procurement is not a concept of privileges that you are getting because you are a minority business owner. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's just a channel to provide more visibility and a fair path for those businesses that are minority owned that because of those causes of being a minority, they struggle sometimes how to access those procurement opportunities mm -hmm. with big corporations. Mm -hmm. So because of that, an entire ecosystem right now is created in different countries where these small businesses that are minority owned, not only LGBT, but from other groups, are not only being able to propose in a fair path to the different corporations, the good and services to, to be able to sell to them, but actually to connect in between them and exploring mm -hmm. partnership, <laughs> joint ventures, allyships, different initiatives that are bringing them combined and collective enough as clusters of different businesses that are trying to succeed, to succeed together. And that's a really powerful concept, especially these days that we are facing a pandemic that we need to be more together than ever before, trying to recover economically faster enough for those businesses actually to succeed. So that's pretty much a resume of what inclusive procurement could be. Amazing, and, and and I think it's a it's it's a great work and a lot of work I think that's been done, and I'm glad you you shared a little bit about the history as well and where it, it started because I think it gives a bit more context as well. And if we if we think about the organization that will be looking for these suppliers, what's what's the benefit for them to have a diverse range of suppliers? I would say if you are someone that are working on procurement, you always struggle to get, to get the best quotes in the more effective way, in the lower cost possible, but also in the highest quality possible. And sometimes for some products and services, those the amount of offer you might receive uh, or supply is not necessarily huge. Sometimes mm -hmm. in some countries, there is only a very small group of corporations, of businesses, sorry, that are offering these specific uh, goods, products, or services that you need for mm -hmm. your supply chain. So what is happening at the first thing that at the surface of the concept of the procurement departments is this is a great source to diversify the, the supply list you have. So diversification is crucial because if you don't diversify, you are not able to innovate and to actually be able to scale in mm -hmm. the competitiveness you are reaching every day in your corporation. The second thing is that when you have an inclusive procurement policy in your company and you are actually allowing those small businesses to offer you what they are doing in a fair path, you are reaching different communities and you are generating an extra impact because receiving them and maybe higher and buying their products and services in this aspect. If you are buying from these small businesses, those small businesses will generate more revenue that is going to be translated in more jobs from those small businesses, that is going to be translated in more taxes that that small business is paying to the government, and that is going to be translated in wellness for the families they are representing between the jobs they are creating and the differing also little suppliers they get mm -hmm. to do what they say they do. So it's actually an entire 360 chain that is giving a lot and spreading a lot of value, not only economic value, but social value to all those little communities. You are not necessarily mm -hmm. impacting when you are a big, massive corporation. And the third and the last thing is that if you do all of that in an umbrella of being respectful with the difference, having an inclusive language, being open and friendly enough to sit in, some, in front of someone that might be LGBT or African-American or with a special need or, is a, or, or a disability or displaced by any conflict within the country and the territory or coming from any different background that can identify that person as a minority member of any type of group. And you are open enough just to sit together and say, hi, hello, how are you? Good morning. What do you have to offer to us in a friendly way? You are breaking a huge chain of discrimination 
and rejection that still exists in the workplace in a lot of the economies mm -hmm. of our planet. And that is a very concrete way to evolve socially to a more fair and safe place for every human being in this planet. Amazing. And linking to that, actually, one thing that came to mind when you were talking about, um, about some of the things and some of the benefits that the organizations can get is what, what, are, what are the numbers saying? Um, or maybe you have a, a case study, actually, that, um, yes. that you may want to share. I have a couple of examples that I would like to share. For example, Marriott Corporations, the big hotel company mm -hmm. that has a, a strong global presence, has reported before that they are gaining so much value on being inclusive and, and diverse within their suppliers. They already, this is numbers for 2018 and 19, they were already assigning a space of over $500 billion per year from the entire pot they have of supplies that they were they are buying every year, over $500 billion are coming just from diverse suppliers. Mm -hmm. So that's a huge number and a lot of businesses for those small businesses that only having the account of matter might be your entire budget of the entire year. So that's, that's something remarkable. The second thing is that McKinsey reports that the corporations that are working on diversity, equality, and inclusion that have actually an inclusive procurement policy can be up to 27% more profitable than the rest of the corporations of the same industry. Mm -hmm. So actually being inclusive also drive more businesses because you are getting more competitive, you are being more open to reach different audiences and that is making you more profitable. And at the end, because we are talking about businesses and not about charity, if you are not making profits, but you are not existing in the long term as a corporation. So yes, it pays off being inclusive on the procurement side regarding profitability and the growth of your revenue mm -hmm. as a corporation. And the third thing that I would like to share in terms of numbers is that in terms of the customers, because people at the end perceive these policies and, and those policies at the end will be translating in different messages, campaigns, and in brand reputation, those companies that are advancing in being more inclusive with their procurement departments, as well as with the entire corporation in a diversity, diversity, equality, and inclusion strategy can increase their customer satisfaction up to 39% more than the other corporations that are not being vocal and visible working on diversity, equality, and inclusion. Mm -hmm. Those numbers ratify and, and, and are evidence enough to say that if you are not working on this as a corporation in 2021, you are already late. You will be arriving to the party at 3 a.m. Because a lot of things are already going on regarding diversity, yeah. equality, and inclusion. And on their procurement, the room of opportunity to continue working and growing is huge because, as I say at the beginning, Julian, this concept is still recent in a lot of uh, regions. When you talk about inclusive procurement in Africa, for example, and when you talk about inclusive procurement in Eastern Europe, for example, this concept are not necessarily deeply attached on the culture of the corporations from there. From the international global ones, American-based headquarter in, in Western Hemisphere, they might. But on the, on the huge corporations that are from those local regions, mm -hmm. uh, this concept might be completely new. So there's a huge opportunity for those individuals that will be hearing this podcast lately that maybe are merged or linked or working with those entities in those uh, different regions to start innovating and diversifying the sources of from where they are getting their suppliers. Completely, completely. And so you, you mentioned a few examples here and, and talked about uh, some, some companies. It, and, and actually you mentioned as well about uh, maybe some regions around the world where companies are not doing that. If you were to encounter one of these companies asking you, okay, Felipe, I, I'd love to help you to help us um, implement that, uh, that inclusive procurement and, and that um, effectively that, that culture of thinking about our suppliers in a more diverse way, what would be telling, what would you be, sorry, what would you be telling them to start with? My experience in, in Colombia and in Latin America doing this have taught me that 
the best way to begin is not trying to implement a program right away that would be expensive, pricey, and costly time-wise too. It's actually with education, Julie. Our first approach will be, and this is what we do in the Colombian LGBT Chamber of Commerce every single day, is to suggest first uh, an initial stage of trainings about what does this mean actually? What, what means to be inclusive? What is for mm -hmm. real talking and, and walking a path of being an organization that is saying that want to become diverse, inclusive, and equal for everybody at the workplace, uh, also on their supply chain and with their customers. So in that sense, we are spending a lot of time uh, connecting with the procurement department, the human resources department, communications departments, third-party agencies, um, even the executive committees of those organizations, generating first awareness about different concepts regarding diversity, equality, and inclusion. Second, illustrating best practices and examples, case studies of who is succeeding in this and why this is relevant, why this is not an arbitrary stand from Felipe or from the chamber, but actually there is a business case that supports and, and, and with a lot of data relying on the, on the fact that this actually works. And the third thing is setting up a roadmap diversity, equality, and inclusion, and especially inclusive procurement don't happen overnight. This is a, a road that is going to take you in different steps that you will be building little by little, and you can go as fast or as slow as your organization needs to be. A lot of corporations run to implement an inclusive procurement program because they want to get certified or because they want to win an award or because they need to, I don't know, win a, a licitation or a bidding process for a bigger project. And sometimes that's not the cool way, but we understand in the dynamic of businesses, those things happen. On the other side, there are more other organizations that are more kind of on the philosophical spectrum of thinking strategically what they need to do to be better and to last longer in the long term. Mm -hmm. And then they take a maybe a slower path to say, let's start building this case uh, little by little. It doesn't matter the speed you are going to have. We always believe the best way to begin is to get educated in this mm -hmm. because there is a lot of terminology. There is a lot of concepts, a lot of misconceptions, a lot of unconscious bias that human beings just have uh, when they work uh, at any organization regarding diversity causes that you need to deconstruct that first in order to understand them properly and then walking towards that in the right way. That would be our first recommendation. The, the other step two, three, and four, you can contact me later for that. I can explain you how we do it in the Colombia LGBT Chamber of Commerce. Amazing. Um, well, one thing you mentioned actually that I found very interesting, and I, I, I loved how you brought it down to um, back to the individual level, because that's, that's what it is at the end of the day. It's not about creating a big strategy that is for the organization, but it's about creating that education first and that awareness. Um, one of the things I often see with organization is there's almost a gap between the, the I don't want to say the reasons why organizations are doing it, but maybe more the, the benefits that they, um, they share with the company as to why diversity and inclusion is such an important thing. And actually, so there is the gap with actually how important it is for individuals, because at the end of the day, an organization can only be diverse and inclusive if their people are walking the talk as well. Um, how, what would you say is actually the benefit of being more diverse and inclusive to each individual of the organization? Because I think if, if people can relate to their own little world and understand it better, they will be able to embrace it better as one. Well. Yes. This is very interesting because it's a debate. What happens is that on the organizational side, you need to understand that the bottom line of the conversation is that being a corporation that is working on diversity, equality, and inclusion is not only socially convenient, but has to be in parallel economically profitable. Mm -hmm. Those things have to be combined. You cannot generate only social value because you will be bankrupt. So you need to generate social value, value at the same time you are generating economic value. So you are changing the world at the same time you are being profitable. If you, those two things are merged with ethics and values, 
you are the best corporation in the planet. Mm -hmm. On the human side, on the individual side of the things, what goes on is that when you are working in an organization that is taking the time to bring you to spaces, events, sharing information with you, illustrating your example, best practices or whatever, about how to be diverse, equal and inclusive with the people that has differences with the majority, actually what is happening is that the organization you are working for is helping you to become a better human being. Mm -hmm. Because what is clear and also goes on the bottom line is that discrimination goes against everything. There is no growth, there is no innovation, there is no creativity, there is no social evolution if you decide to leave people aside from that prosperity. You cannot afford the fact of leaving anybody aside a social evolution movement. Because if you decide to do that, you are not evolving, you are just segregating. So it will be just a little amount of people that will evolve and become richer or smarter or clever or even more beautiful. But then the people that is leaving you behind at some point might chase you. And that is not social evolution. In that sense, when you as an individual, as a staffer, as an executive, as a manager, as a supervisor, as an intern, wherever you are in the, the chart of the organization, allow yourself the opportunity to participate in those events, spaces, webinars, reading those reports, listening those stories, you are gaining content that is making you a better human being. You are also developing different skills, maybe soft skills that are going to help you do, to do your job in a more productive and effective way. You might gain empathy. You might get, you might get also social awareness. You might deconstruct some mindsets you have. You might jump on some unconscious biases you are might have in, in front of X, Y, and Z people that are living in X, Y, and Z way. And then that is going to help you to interact better with that person. Mm -hmm. So I'm saving time that I'm losing already in my mind, thinking this guy is different than me and I don't like him because of A, B, and C. And actually you will invest that time saying, let's sit together and let's bring this report quickly because we want to achieve these objectives and actually target those goals that we set up together. And you will be deconstructing a lot of barriers that sometimes are more mental barriers than anything that at the end that is only going to help you to become more productive, more competitive, therefore a better human being. Mm -hmm. Very true. The, there is, um, a, 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 it relates very much to, to that. And I think you, you almost went there a few times during our conversation. But um, when we connected the first time, you said something that really, really resonated with me um, towards the end of our conversation, I think, actually. And you said, we won't be successful after a pandemic if we leave people behind. I'd love if you could expand a little bit more on that and in the context of inclusive procurement, but in general as well, because I think it's a, uh, it's, it's such an interesting way to link the pandemic we went through to the diversity and inclusion and how important, how even more important it is these days. Yes. And, and what I would say regarding that question, Julian, is that thanks to ISEGA, I became a peace advocate but not a peace advocate thinking in global peace and war peace and all these general concepts that sometimes are so broad and so different and difficult to digest because mm -hmm. our realities in the global are so different. What I, what I believe when I talk about peace right now is about inner peace. Because if I am in peace with myself, just that fact avoids conflict with anybody regarding any difference. So because I am a truly believer on that, in every action I am doing with my team in the Colombian LGBT Chamber of Commerce and as well as in my life, is proposing that social evolution and especially this modern society we are living this day that is so interconnected and so virtual because we were already digital before the pandemic, mm -hmm. actually. Um, I don't think we are evolving into another stage of our lives if we decide that I want to go here but without you or without this person, I don't think this person fits the reality that I'm creating and I want to live in my world. And why I don't believe that? Because I'm a truly believer. Every single human being has a purpose in this life and has some, has some value to add to anybody. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, I challenge 
the preconceptions of a lot of people that says, I don't like you for who you are, for how you look, for who you love, or in who you believe and who you pray to. Because those are personal, either reasons, decisions, facts of life that are conditions that you have as a human being. And it's on my side to open my mind, to understand the difference and to respect those differences for them not to crash, but actually to combine and become a high performance connection. Mm -hmm. If I am able to deconstruct the blocks that I have on my mind that are telling me that I don't like you because you are this, this and this, or you look like this, or you love like this, or you pray to this uh, God that I don't believe, what I'm doing is putting blocks in front of me that are making me more far from you. But if I deconstruct those blocks that I have in my mind, I might be getting closer to you at the end to decide if we are going to walk a path together or not, but at least not to conflict. Mm -hmm. And that's the very, 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 I would say, bottom line of the conversation is, is that when I promote diversity, equality, and inclusion, I'm not saying we, like, we need to like everybody or we need to be friends with everybody. That's, that is actually not the purpose of the entire message. The purpose of the entire message, it says, I need to walk in my life respecting the differences of everybody because in that way, I will be avoiding conflict that I don't need to have mm -hmm. because I have a bigger purpose in life. And if every single human being can interiorize that in their own philosophies of lives, in their own cultural, familiar, and even religious beliefs, the world will be so different. Uh, and this is just talking pre-pandemic as a general concept of life. Now, after 2019 and 2020, when this pandemic began and exploded, when I told you that sentence is uh, that I don't think we are going to succeed as humanity if we are leaving people beside or, or, or putting people aside, is because we already lost more than 5 million people in the planet. There are already a lot of families that got destroyed because of this pandemic. A lot of businesses that already disappeared. A lot of societies that went back 20 or 30 years in social evolutions. When you see indicators of economies and societies in different countries in terms of unemployment, of poverty level, levels, of uh, yeah, job loss, actually, businesses that got bankrupt and closed, uh, education cycles that got stopped and broke too. What you will understand is that it's like you pretty much pull the pedal on the brake and actually brake so hard a machine that was moving towards evolution that recovering is going to demand us velocity. And in the velocity, we need to put right now, like starting back the engines and pushing the pedal on the accelerator and going faster because we already, like imagine we were in the race of our lives and we were pushed back by this pandemic 23 years of the road we were already in or at. What is going to happen is that we need to speed up. And speeding up is only going to be possible if we involve everybody. Mm -hmm. Because if I start speeding up, leaving people aside, at the end, I'm not going to reach further. I'm just going to go faster with no direction. Because the direction is actually the one that is going to be able to drive by the majority of people included, that is going to walk towards something that we were pursuing as humanity. And I'm a truly believer we are not going to be able to achieve that if we leave people aside. No, I, I, I completely agree. And it's interesting when you were talking about this, there's a strong image that came to me. You talked about the race and, and pushing, the, pushing on the pedal. And it made me think about um, Formula One races where they stop on the side. And if the entire team is not in synchronicity and working together, regardless of their differences and where they come from and their specialties, if they don't work together, they're not going to be able to push the car back on the racetrack as quickly as possible. And, and they will lose actually some of, um, some of that velocity you were talking about. And that's, that's the image that came to mind when you say that. Yes, and let me just add something extra. It's very interesting how this pandemic is also showing us cases on how to succeed or how to fail. 
Mm-hmm. Take, for example, what happened at the beginning of the pandemic with Sweden. Sweden is a highly developed country. Mm-hmm. A lot of us, we look up to them to learn that innovates in so many matters, in so many fields, and it's such a great example of society in so many aspects. And they went wild with the cases of COVID and, mm-hmm. and closing and opening, and, and it was just poorly managed. And who would think that a country like Sweden will, will fail in something they are so structured and so prepared and so planned. You will never believe. But there is this other little individual down in the Pacific Ocean that is called New Zealand. And just, we just needed to fight to have a very strong women as prime minister that say, I'm closing the island period. And no one goes in and no one goes out. And I'm going to take these measures that will be strong and unpopular and I don't care. And everyone is going to comply. And was the first country in the planet to be COVID free. So that's really interesting because you will have different examples in different places and different territories that will tell you, not necessarily because we were following this path and we had this reputation and we have these mm-hmm. indicators, we necessarily succeed on dealing with this pandemic. Look the craziness of the US that even with such a high level of assignations, there is this country is one of the countries that today has the biggest population that says, I don't want to get vaccinated because X, mm-hmm. Y, and C. Because this is a devil plan because the Democrats want to insert a chip in the vaccines to learn our minds or because actually whatever stupid reason a lot of people is inventing regarding mm-hmm. vaccines. <clears throat> and then this is also very interesting because how a pandemic can become so political, so polarizing, so ideological when since we are born, we are getting vaccines mm-hmm. for anything in life. So it's very interesting because humanity... I, I happen to be marble and, and really amazed how humanity is behaving with this pandemic. We are probably facing the worst moments of humanity, but at the same time, we were lucky enough to have so much developed science and medicine to produce a vaccine in record times. We have never produced a vaccine in such a short amount of time. To produce that and multiply that fast enough for the majority of the countries to start vaccinating people within a year time frame or even less. And now we are facing challenges like, for example, easily one third of humanity saying, I don't want to get vaccinated. Like, it's, it's very funny. Like, it's, it's, just, it's just funny how we behave as humanity sometimes. And, and at the end, everything falls in this umbrella of diversity, equality, and inclusion. And that's why I call it a race, because the synchronization we might need to have as humanity to overcome this and actually go out successful. And I believe we will, but it will just take maybe longer. I, mm-hmm. I was expecting 2021 was the year we will like jump the line and say COVID is over. Today in July, I'm already aware that is not happening this year. Mm-hmm. And, and part of 2022, and ideally that would be the last year, COVID still will be around us and, and hunting us on our economies and our families and in our societies. Uh, but at the end, if we are able to synchronize ourselves better as societies and as humanity, maybe that deadline will be shorter. Mm-hmm. Let's just hope for the best. Very true. Well, thank you very much for, for all these words of wisdom. We're coming to an end of our podcast now and our episodes. Um, but I do like to ask you a, a last question. Uh, do you have any words of wisdom to, to share with our listeners before we, um, before we finish? Yes, thank you, Julian, for asking that too. I, I, I would like just to share with the audience that um, working on diversity, equality, and inclusion at the workplace, in a corporation, or even in a small business, or talking about this in your life, wherever you do it, Pays off. That's mm. something very important that I want to share with the audience. And, and please take this as a takeaway of this of these minutes. It does pay off. Like it, it, when you start reading about this, when you start joining groups talking about this, when you start driving leading conversations and maybe changing people's minds about what truly means being diverse, equal, and inclusive, <clears throat> at the end you do become a better human being. And I won't be tired to repeat this. You will be deconstructing a lot of mindsets, overcoming a lot of unconscious bias you have as a human being. And you will see how being a more respectful and open human being is only going to 
add you up in your quality of life. The purpose of your life will be clearer and actually maybe the path to achieve the goals you want to achieve because you are seeing other people you were not seeing before as possible friends, partners, couples, investors, talent, whatever, suppliers, whatever. If you start considering that people you were mentally neglecting or rejecting and maybe you put them on the entire um, spectrum of the people you have around to do things with, maybe you will achieve easier and faster your, your, your purpose of life. And that will be my, my, my only message to share. Uh, also, I can tell you where to read and where to go and what to do, but I just want to leave you with that general message. It is, it, working on diversity, equality, and inclusion actually pays off. And, and, and I would invite everybody to get more interested into this, to get involved in different causes and social movements and activities and projects and initiatives, especially right now that virtually is so easy and sometimes mm -hmm. free. <laughs> so uh, I will invite everyone to get more interested into this. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much again for, um, for these last words of wisdom and for everything you shared with us. Um, just to finish off, if anyone has any more questions for you or want to get in touch and, um, and maybe talk about more about inclusive procurement or anything else we discussed, what's the best way to reach you? The best way to reach me might be social media. That is easier because with emails, I go sometimes very crazy. You can find me uh, as Felipe Cardenas in all the social media uh, there possible. Um, I have profiles in Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter. Very more active probably on Instagram and in LinkedIn regarding this. Or just look up for the Colombian LGBT Chamber of Commerce in social media. And I'm linked with all those uh, profiles. So you just connect with both myself personally or with the entity that I'm leading, that is the Colombian LGBT Chamber of Commerce again. And then I will be more than happy to get connected with anybody from this audience. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you. And I'll put all these links and contacts in the notes of the, of the episode as well. Thank you very much again. Um, it was a pleasure having you. I loved our conversation. I think there is still so much more we could talk about. Um, but I think we, we covered a lot of ground already and, and I hope I'll have the chance to have you again maybe in the near future on, on another episode as well. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Julian, for this opportunity. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, please share it with others, post about it on social media or leave a rating and review. We'd love to hear from you. To catch all the latest from us, you can follow us on Instagram, Facebook or YouTube at as diverse as two peas in a pod. Thanks again and I'll see you next time.